Uh, but Jeremy, uh, what, um, the, the Lion House Marina, and he's a lock keeper, and the top of the day is the Raven Scrolls and Ship Lord. So, can I go to Jeremy? <laughs>
cross pieces going with the grain designed to shatter the hull of the enemy ship. Oopsie. To lay your ship alongside another and jump on board requires considerable seamanship. To drive your ship at right angles into the hull of the enemy ship with enough force to shatter its timbers required exceptional seamanship. But we always reckon our boaters at Limehouse make a pretty good job of it. <laughs> so we're in the time of the Romans. This is a Roman soldier from the time of Caesar. The Romans were not particularly good at the seamanship side, and so they needed to develop something to give them an edge over the Carthaginians. What they developed was this, a drop-down gangway known as the corvus, or <coughs> of its spike, which dropped down and embedded itself in the enemy ship. And they reckon they could get around 70 soldiers across that gangway in around 20 seconds. But the Romans actually weren't too keen on the whole idea of naval warfare. These are Roman cannonballs, fired from these, the ballista. So this was the observation of one veteran before this battle, which of course is Romans against Romans, or to be precise, Romans against Romans and Egyptians. What of our wounds and swords done to displease Antony, that he should give his confidence to rotten timbers? Let Egyptians and Phoenicians contend at sea. Give us the land where we know well how to die upon the spot or gain the victory. In other words, what are we doing setting out to sea in leaky old boats to do something that we could do far more efficiently, effectively, and comfortably on land? A similar <coughs> has been shared by many of us who go sailing. Okay. I'm going to skip ahead. You'll remember this gentleman from last year. This is what we looked like at that time. The Romans, of course, built bridges. Here is London Bridge around AD 50 to 60. But this vessel here would not have come all the way from Rome. This would have come probably only from Dover, or maybe from here. We just moved down to the south coast for a moment. And it may have come from here. Even my schoolboy Latin can manage that one. Portus Magnus which we now know as Southampton, opposite Vectis, the Isle of Wight. And even then, the Romans might have looked at the River Way coming down to the Thames, the River Allen coming down to the Channel, and thought, well, the job is at least half done. Wouldn't it be handy to join them up? But that wouldn't actually happen for a few years yet. I'm going to skip over one or two centuries. This is uh, obviously the Roman lighthouse at Dover. This was the Saxons. And when they arrived in this quiet anchorage near where I work, this is Lighthouse Marina down here, they found that this was a cliff. If you look at some of the local churches here, they're actually towering above the river because they're standing on a cliff edge. Because of the orange colour of the soil, it was a red cliff, and that was the name that the Saxons gave to it, Red Cliff, which became Radcliffe, or Radcliffe, as we now know it. <coughs> Moving on. It is always a temptation for an armed and agile nation to call upon a neighbour and to say, we invaded you last night, we are quite prepared to fight, unless you pay us cash go away. That was how Rudyard Kipling described the arrival of these guys, as recorded in the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, AD 793. In this year, the harrowing inroads of heathen men made lamentable havoc in the Church of God in Holy Island by rapine and slaughter. This was the raid on Lindisfarne or Holy Island. Moving in, AD 851, this year, the heathens now, for the first time, remained over winter in the Isle of Thanet. Well, Thanet, the Isle of Thanet, is down here, but when the Vikings came, that's what it would have looked like. It was actually an island. 
The same year came 350 ships into the mouth of the Thames, the crew of which went upon land and stormed Canterbury. You can see they wouldn't have had far to walk down there. And London. And then marched southward over the Thames into Surrey. 854, this year the heathen men for the first time remained over winter in the Isle of Shep E. E being an island. Here it is. That's what it would look like. 894, in this year the Danes marched over Northumberland and East Anglia till they came into Essex eastward on an island that is out at sea called Mersey. Here it is, Mersey Island. Then in the same year before winter, the Danes who abode in Mersey towed their ships up on the Thames, here they come. And thence up the Lee. Now what happened to them then, and how King Alfred outwitted them by stranding their ships there, and how he helped to create our 2012 Olympic site, that uh, is another story for another day. So we'll leave them there for the moment at Hartford. And we'll move on fairly swiftly, I think. We've got a lot to get through. That's when the Danes attacked Canterbury, captured the Archbishop, Archbishop Alfage, murdered him, and the Greenwich Parish Church of St Alfage marks the spot where his body was thrown into the Thames. AD 1014. This year, King Sven, the King of Denmark, ended his days, and the fleet all chose Knut, the King, whereupon advised all the councillors of England that they should send after King Ethelred, saying that no sovereign was dearer to them than their natural lord if he would govern them better than he did before. In other words, we didn't think much of you while you were in power, but the new lot are worse. AD 1014, as recorded by the Norwegians <coughs> in their Olaf saga, Ethelred returns from exile with company, having enlisted King Olaf of Norway to assist him. They sailed into the Thames with their fleet, but the Danes had a castle within. On the other side of the river is a great trading place which is called Sutherberg. There the Danes had also raised a great work. Between the castle and Suffolk, there was a bridge so broad that two wagons could pass each other upon it. So here we are, London Bridge. King Ethelred ordered a great assault, but the Danes defended themselves bravely, and King Ethelred <coughs> could make nothing of it. King Ethelred was very anxious to get possession of the bridge, and he called together all the chiefs to consult. Then said King Olaf, I have a cunning plan. <laughs> King Olaf ordered great platforms of floating wood to be tied together with hazel bands, and for these he took down the roofs of old houses, and with these covered over his ships' sides. Here they are. Under this screen he set pillars so high and stout that there was both room for swinging their swords, and the roofs were strong enough to withstand the stones cast down upon them. Now when the fleet and men were ready, they rode quite up under the bridge, laid their cables around the piles which supported it, and then rode off with all their ships as hard as they could down the stream. The piles were thus shaken in the bottom, the bridge gave way, and a great part of the men upon it fell into the river, and all the others fled. <coughs> now, quite what Ethelred thought of this rather gung-ho action is not recorded. He had its true wanted his bridge um, recaptured, but a certain classic line from Michael Caine in the Italian book <laughs> does come to mind. But the Norwegians recorded the event in their saga with this poem, London Bridge is broken down, gold is won and bright renown, shields resounding, war horns sounding, hills is shouting in the din, arrows singing, mail coats ringing, Odin makes our Olaf win. It's not Shakespeare, and it probably worked better in Old Norse, but children have been reciting a version of that ever since. I'm going to skip back 
this out a few centuries in view of the time and just roll on. That was King Canute's palace, or the site of it, the first Viking king of all England, age 21. I'm going to skip on a few centuries. The Normans, their castles. I'm going to skip on London Bridge, the first one built in stone. 1176 to 1209. And there it is, as it was completed. I'm going to skip on through the Black Death and down to Southampton again in the reign of Henry V. <coughs> Grass Dieu, built around 1416 in Southampton in a dry dock. And according to contemporary observers, she was around 1,500 tons, 130 feet in length, and around 50 feet in beam. For that, of course, was absolutely ridiculous. Nobody in Europe had the ability to build a ship of anything like that size at that time. Or, so it was thought, until 1933, when these timbers in the River Hamble were finally subjected to more careful scrutiny. They'd long been thought to be the remains, perhaps, of a Viking ship or something like that. But they were, in fact, dated correctly to that period. And although there's nothing much left, it is clearly the key <coughs> of a ship of exactly that size. And if you go up the handle, You'll pass by this distinctive yellow mark, and you'll be passing over the wreck of what was once the most powerful warship in Europe. That was the Grass Dieu. Moving on swiftly, and we'll pass on to Henry the Seventh, who built this dry dock in Portsmouth and it was used by his son later on. This was the Michael, built in Scotland, and she, in turn, became the most powerful warship in the world, and it was as though Scotland had built one of these. Henry VIII, meanwhile, he had built, in his father's dry dock in Portsmouth, this vessel, the Mary Rose, which had a long and successful career of some 36 years, but when he got wind of the, the Michael, he was probably one of the first to utter those immortal words, we're going to need a bigger boat. Mm -hmm. That was the Mary Rose. Now her cannon <coughs> were not on board when she was launched. The cannon came from London specifically from here. All of the gun founders in England at that time were actually in London, and cannon were kept here in the town of London. And so the Mary Rose would have had to come all the way from Portsmouth round to London to have her armament fitted. And so Henry VIII would have decided that this was silly, and that therefore the next ship would be built not in Portsmouth, but in London. That's one of the Mary Rose's cannon. There's the engraving on it. Robert and John Owen, brethren, born in the city of London, the sons of an English, made this basket, anno 1537. Doesn't mean they had a hard time casting it. <laughs> <laughs> it refers to the type of weapon, but built clearly in a London town. There's the Michael. This was her opponent, the Henri Grasse Adieu, the great Harry built at Woolwich rather than in Portsmouth. And that was the origin of the Royal Dockyard of Woolwich. There she is. 
There's the mic hole. It was the captain of both the Mary Rose and the Henri Grasse Adieu who set up a little sailing club for his chums. <coughs> they could have gone with Deptford Sailing Club, but at their inaugural meeting they went with the master, wardens and assistants of the guild, fraternity or brotherhood of the most glorious and undividable trinity and of St Clement in the parish of Deptford Strond in the county of Kent. Their hitted note paper must have been impressive. But they went on, of course, to become known as Trinity House. They were put in charge, first of all, of pilotage, then of voyage, and later, of course, of lighthouses. But that's another story. Now, in view of the time, I'm going to skip on to... If you go upriver from where I work at Limehouse and wander along the riverfront, you'll come across this building here. Here it is. It's actually one of the ventilation shafts for the Wotherhide Tunnel. And you'll see this stone tablet nicely set and remarkably preserved just inside the railings. Here it is. And this is what it says. This tablet is in memory of Sir Hugh Willoughby, Stephen Burrow, William Burrow, Sir Martin Frobisher, and other navigators who, in the latter half of the 16th century, set sail from this reach of the River Thames near Ratcliffe Cross to explore the northern seas. A rather vague citation, but intentionally so, as we'll see. This is the world as we know it, according to Mr. Mercator's wonderful projection. It could equally well look like that, but it would leave a lot of water in the middle. And so traditionally, we see it that way, with the prime meridian down the middle through Greenwich, though it could just as easily have gone through Paris, and the North Pole at the top. The world as we don't know it quite so well, according to Mr. Mercator's wonderful projection, the problem being that the North Pole is also over here, or here, or here, or here, because of course the meridians converge to a point. And this was the known unknown. They knew that they did not know what was up here. But it was thought, or fervently hoped, that by setting off in this direction, slightly to the west of Greenland, there might be a northwest passage across the top of the world to China and the Spice Islands, or possibly by going in this direction, northeast, there might be a route that way. Well, clearly, this direction was obviously blocked by Greenland, so this seemed a more promising route to take. And so it was that in 1553, 51, sorry, a company was set up, the Mystery and Company of Merchant Adventurers for the Discovery of Regions, Dominions, Islands, and Places Unknown. And the directors were Sir Hugh Willoughby, Sebastian Cabot, the son of John Cabot the Explorer, and Richard Chancellor, and they called themselves the China Company. And this was the first voyage, these three ships, that set off in 1553 in this direction. Now, in fact, Sir Hugh Willoughby was in overall charge of the expedition a post for which no previous sailing experience was required. And sadly, his ship and his crew were lost, and the ship and their frozen bodies were found the following year by Russian fishermen in this area here. And it was Richard Chancellor and Stephen and William Bower that managed to carry on as far as here to Archangel, 
and then to make their way a further 400 miles, yeah, to Moscow, where they established <coughs> links with Tsar Ivan IV, who later became Ivan the Terrible. <coughs> Stephen Bauer, a couple of years later, made his way a little further to Novaya Zemlya. <coughs> And it was Martin Frobisher in 76 and 77, he tried to find the northwest passage in this direction. <coughs> what they did not know, what they could not have known at that time, was that the top of our world looked like this. And it would be many years before a passage was found. The very straits over here were discovered in 1648. And the North West Passage eventually, or well, the North East Passage was done first by the Swede Eric Nordenskjold, and the North West Passage later on by <coughs> before he went to the South Pole. <coughs> it looks like that. If we go back one, that's how it was until quite recently. <coughs> that's how it is today. And today, the Northeast Passage, or Northern Sea Route, is a commercial waterway for much of the year. Now, I've got about five or ten minutes left. I'm going to skip ahead, and I'm going to go over to here. A painting of Wapping, around 1836. And almost by chance, in the background, the artist here has captured a ship being built. She is the Great Western, because this is not walking in London, but <coughs> walking in Bristol. And this is Bell's first ship being built in Bristol. But for her engine, no other company would do but Maudsley, Sons and Field in London. Henry Maudsley had built the block-making machines for Brunel's father, and only they could be trusted to install the engine. And so the Great Western was part sailed, part towed, all the way from Bristol round to Blackwall to have her engine installed. That's for William Patterson. There's Brunel. There's the block-making machine, our secret weapon at the end of the Napoleonic Wars. So there she is, the Great Western, 1837, and she was 235 feet in length. There she is, at sea. Brunel's second ship, also built in Bristol, was originally to be called the Mammoth, and she, in turn, was the largest ship in the world at the time that she was launched. Of course, she became better known as the Great Britain. Funnily enough, this machine, the Nazmith Steam Hammer, was actually designed and built specially to forge the paddle shaft of the Great Britain, because originally the Great Britain was to have a paddle engine. Brunel, of course, changed his mind halfway through and went for screw propulsion, so Nazmith's steam hammer was not needed at that stage but it would come in very handy later on. She became the Great Britain. There she is, being floated out. And this is one of the earliest photographs ever, ever taken by William Fox Talbot, and believed to be the very first photograph ever taken of a ship. Great Britain waiting to go through the lock of Bristol. There she is. And this, I've got about five minutes, is Mast House Terrace Pier, about a mile down river from where I work at Limehouse. The Thames Clippers will let you off there if you ask nicely. It's a sort of a request stop. Only the people that live there get on and off at this pier. 
But if you've been standing in the same spot <coughs> across the river in November 1857, then this is what you would have seen. She was originally known as Leviathan. Mm. She was actually launched as the Leviathan, but registered as the Great Eastern. 690 feet in length. Had she been launched with her masts and funnels up, she would have looked like this. If you just go back one, you can see that when this photograph was taken, Two of the funnels were in place, <coughs> but she went on to have five funnels and six masts. But that's roughly how she looked only a very few months before she was launched. And if you go to the site today, you will find the launch site of the Great Eastern. And people who go there often say, well, I thought the Great Eastern went sideways into the water. How come these timbers are going back perpendicular to the river? Well, in fact, if we look at a photograph taken at the time, if you look just down here, scratched on the negative, you may just make out that was taken November the 2nd, 1857. And one of these guys here may be Brunel, we don't know for sure. But the launching waves were here. <coughs> Here's Brunel, photographed. And so the launching waves that you can see today correspond to that bit there, a tiny proportion of the overall length of the ship. <coughs> but as you know, eventually she got into the water Brunel was dead just a few days later. But she was indeed, at the time she was launched, once again, the largest ship in the world. <coughs> I'll leave Brunel there for a moment. <coughs> now, I think I've got about two minutes left, and I think that's probably a good time just to pause, and uh, I think we'll leave it Translate them when you're at university. Ah, oh, thank you. <laughs> you had to do that. Yeah. 
Yes. Yeah, it's just that one. Sorry about that. I, I, think, I think there are, there are two or three versions, aren't there? Slightly different. You have the disadvantage where you have to study the damn things and what have you, where they came from. I wish they'd have shot somebody before they did it. Ah, no, no, no. To be honest. No, well, we need to be thankful that they're there to record that little bit about history. Uh, anyway, thank God for the uh, Penguin translation. Yes. 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 <laughs> Any more questions? Thank you, Rob. Rob, would you like to walk around? Yes, thank you, Mr. President. I'll be delighted. Um, we were very fascinated with your first talk here a minute, and I was asked by several members to get you back again, as I did. And once again, you've given us a most fascinating and interesting talk. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, the only snag is, as you quite rightly said, the time involved in our luncheon time is really rather too short. Uh, everybody thoughtfully enjoyed you before, and they did. I can see they did again. Thank you so much for coming. It's a pleasure. Yeah.